Hi, and welcome to the first virtual February reading. It's a short month, but it's not short on poetry. We've got plenty of poetry here for you today, and we're glad you're here to listen. Uh, we've got three great features, Diane Seuss, Lauren Camp, Katie Porter, who won't be reading in that exact order, but we're really glad that you're here to listen, and I'm letting in some more folks here. Let me focus on that, Robbie. All right, thank you. Um, well, we're going to start today with Diane Seuss. Diane is the author of six books of poetry, and I think one of them is most is Modern Poetry, which is forthcoming from Gray Wolf Press in March. And I'll put up a link to that when I'm finished reading mm -hmm. this bio. Mm -hmm. She's also got Frank Sonnets, which was the winner of the Penn Volker Prize, the LA Times Book Prize, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the Pulitzer. Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the LA Times Book Prize. Four-Legged Girl was a finalist for the Pulitzer. Wolf Lake, White Gown Blown Open, received the Juniper Prize. I can't, I'm not, it's already starting. I'm trying to find it. Please meet yourself. If you are just coming in, for some reason, Zoom is not muting you the way it ought to. So please mute yourself. Thank you. And where was I? Um, she received the John Updike Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters in 2021 and was recently elected to the Academy of American Poets Board of Chancellors. Mm -hmm. She was raised by a single mother in rural Michigan, which she continues to call home. Mm -hmm. So take it away, Diane, and I'll put up some links. Thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. What a time to be alive, right? Um, I'm going to read um, three poems and one from the last three collections I decided. Um, so do you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna read a poem from Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl and a poem from Frank Sonnets and a poem from my forthcoming uh, collection, Modern Poetry. So let's begin. This is from Still Life with Two Dead Peacocks and a Girl, and it's the first poem in the collection. And I'm hoping everyone can hear me okay. Okay. I have lived my whole life in a painting called Paradise with the milkweeds splitting at the seams, emancipating their seeds that were once packed in their pods like the wings and hollow bones of a damp bird held too tightly in a green hand. And the giant jade moths stuck to the screen door as if glued there. And the gold fields and stone silos and the fugitive cows known for escaping their borders. I have lived in a painting called Paradise and even the bad parts were beautiful. There are fields of needles arranged into flowers, their sharp ends meeting at the center. And from a distance, the fields full of needle flowers look blue from their silver reflecting the sky or white as lilies if the day is overcast. And there in the distance is a meadow filled with the fluttering skirts of opium poppies. On the hillside is Moon Cemetery where the tombstones are hobnailed or prismed like cut glass bowls. And some are shaped so precisely like the trunks of trees that birds build their nests in the crooks of their granite limbs. And some of the graves are shaped like child-sized tables with stone tablecloths and teacups. Yes, 
I've lived in a painting called Paradise. The hollyhocks loom like grandfathers with red pocket watches. And off in the distance, the water is ink and the ships are white paper with scribblings of poems and musical notations on their sides. There are rabbits, mink colored ones and rabbits that are mystics humped like haystacks. And at Moon Cemetery, it's an everyday event to see the dead rise from their graves as glittering as they were in life to once more pick up the plow or the pen or the ax or the spoon or the brush or the bowl, for it is a cemetery named after a moon and moons never stay put. There are bees in the air flying off to build honeycombs with pollen heavy on their back legs. And in the air, birds of every ilk, the gray kind that feed from the ground and the ones that scream to announce themselves and the ravens who feed on the rabbits until their black feathers are edged in gold. And in the air also are little gods and devils trying out their wings, some flying, some falling, and making a little cream colored blip in the sea. Yes, all of my life I have lived in a painting called Paradise with its frame of black varnish and gold leaf. And I am told some girls slide their fingers over the frame and feel the air outside of it. And some even climb over the edge and plummet into whatever is beyond it. Some say it is hell and some say just another bolder paradise. And some say a dark wilderness and some say an unswept museum or library floor and some say a long lost love waits there wearing bloody riding clothes return from war and some say freedom which is a word that tastes strange like a green plum And this is just one sonnet from Frank Sonnets. Um, I don't want to say my, much about the Twitter thing going on around one of my measly little sonnets that has created a big kerfluffle, um, aside from the fact that I guess it's good people are talking about sonnets and poetry, if they can do it with some degree of kindness. And this is, uh, this arrives from the wisdom of my mom. The sonnet, like poverty, teaches you what you can do without. To have, as my mother says, a wish in one hand and shit in another. That was an answer to, I wish I had an Instamatic camera and a father. Wish in one hand, she says, shit in another. She still says it. When she tells me she wishes I were there to have some of her bean soup, she answers herself. Wish in one hand, she says, shit in another. Poverty, like a sonnet, is a good teacher. The kind that wraps your knuckles with a ruler, but not the kind that throws a dictionary across the room and hits you in the brain with all the words that ever were. Boxed fathers buried deep are still fathers, teacher says. Do without the, without and, without hot dogs in your baked beans. A sonnet is a mother. Every word a silver dollar. Shit in one hand, she says. Wish in another. And I'll end with a poem from my forthcoming modern poetry. It's called Gertrude Stein.
And the only thing you need to know is that Stein, some of you know, um, is one of her collections of weird, interesting, courageous poems is called Tender Buttons. Gertrude Stein. I just brushed the dog there on the dog's couch. I was wearing a black, well, to call it a gown is a criminal overstatement, a black rag. It became clear to me, and when I say clear, I mean the moment went crystal cathedral. I could see my life from not a long shot, but what they used to call an increment of heart, a baby step to the right or left of myself, about the width of a corrective baby shoe. There I was, broad-shouldered, witch-shaped, without the associated magic, with my dog in my shack, once mauve faded to pink, beyond sex or reason, a numbness had set in. Gertrude Stein, Picasso's portrait of her, that above it all or within it all, look on not a face, but the planes that suggest a face, the eyes aren't really lined up right, or the real eyes are peering from behind the cutout shapes of the eyes. The couch had been a sort of, not a gift, but a donation of sorts from a person with plenty of money. When it was dragged into my house, it was already stately, but with worn patches and stains. A trinity of dogs over time had laid claim to it three egotists. To brush the dog meant I had to visit it in its monarchy. And in that visit, that single prismatic increment, I saw I'd become, maybe all arrive in their own time, some before dying, some after, a draped artifact, haystack or headstone rising out of the plains. And then with fascination and a degree of sadness and even objectivity. I loved, as I once loved tender buttons, myself. Thank you. Thanks. So thank you so much for those poems and what an ending. You, I just was without words for a moment there, which is rare. Thanks so much. And our next reader will be Katie Porter. Katie Porter's most recent poetry collection is Small Mammals, published by May Apple Press in 2023. Poems from small mammals can be found in Rattle, Verse Daily, Terrain, Autumn Sky, Poetry Daily, and elsewhere. The recipient of a 2023 Individual Artist Fellowship at the established level from the California Arts Council, she is founder and editor of the long-running Pomelion, a, circle, a journal of poetry, and is executive director of Inlandia Institute a literary nonprofit and publisher. She lives with her family in inland Southern California. And then she gives her web page, which I will put in there in a minute when she starts reading. But before she does, thank you again, Diane. And you can mute yourself and then um, Katie can unmute her, she did. And she, I hope, will appear on the screen. So go ahead. Katie. Hi there. Hey, thank you, Robbie, and thank you so much, Diane. Um, and I'm I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, I don't know what I'm going to read. I'm just going to pick a few poems and read for ten minutes. Um, small mammals, contrary to what it sounds like, is not really about um, small mammals. It's more about the human mammal um 
some of them are small and some of them are not so small. And in particular, the variety of mammal that we call teenagers. Um, I am, I think I'm going to start with this uh, poem that is a praise song. So, oh, and here is my book. Um, also, I want to give a plug to my cover artist, Julie Heffernan. Look her up. Okay. Praise song for sons. Praise dirty socks left on the bathroom floor. Praise checkered vans and the clods of dirt or sometimes dog poo they bring in. Praise the car keys missing from the rack by the front door and praise the car that my teenager rode off in. Praise the wheels on the car and praise the tires that do not deflate while driving. Praise the windshield that shields him from wind. Praise the horn that alerts the car that cut in front of him at the light. Praise the bumper that collapses upon contact but spares my son. Praise the professional photos they didn't want taken, but sat for anyway. And praise the frames that hold their youthful faces. Praise their acne. Praise their obstinacy. Praise their hair that has grown past their shoulders. Oh, how luxurious it is, their long locks and the spiral curl that dangles from a ponytail that springs back when taut. Praise their feather soft hair when they were small. Praise the moisture maniac that tames all. Praise bins of baby clothes collected in the dusty cellar. Praise my son's friends too, because I love them as my own. Praise the gods do not take them home too soon, though one was called home last Saturday. Praise that one's grieving mother praise that she still has one son and forgive the one gone for he knows not what he's done okay um okay this is uh well i'll just read it my youngest son's best friend calls me at 7 a.m. I told him if you're just going to black out for two days, you should bring my skateboard back, he says. I am just waking. How long have you been up, I ask, swinging my legs off the side of the bed, opening the cabinet for my morning meds. Since four, he says. I don't sleep much anymore. When he called yesterday, I said, call any time. At least he waited until morning. He didn't go into work again today, I say. Yeah, there was a picture of him on in someone's story on Snapchat, passed out on the floor last night, says the friend. What time, I ask? Ten hours ago. Oh, so my kid ho drove home inebriated? No, he says, not drunk, stoned. Driving stoned is just like driving tired, as if that makes any sense. I just miss my friend, he says, crying. I miss him too. I need coffee. Can we talk again later? Okay, I love you. I love you too. Okay. How about which gears just um well no i'm going to keep keep it going we've had um a lot of interesting uh happenings with regard to raising teenagers especially teenage boys um so this is, this is another one of those. 
you are not my son. I am not your mother. And yet I say, I love you and mean it, even as you lie on the gurney by the side of the road, having swallowed every pill you own. My son, your best friend, beside me, having climbed a mountain in darkness to find you, and you, incoherent, laid out before us, your soldier father standing on the shoulder. Ambulance, the dazzle of flashing lights, blinds us. Your father is furious with fear, heaving. We shiver that we are not cold, and while I do not know him, I pull him close, tell him, no tough love, only love. There would be no sucking it up this time. Days later, in recovery in ICU, we bring you cheeseburger, fries, a milkshake, nurse sitting quietly as you tell us how you believed that if you looked hard enough at the clock, you could stop time, turn the minute hand back. The pills that sent your body into seizures nearly killed you, then little aftershocks as the pills wore off, so they put you under. Now you are fully awake, and we hear only what we want you to say. You promise never to do this again. Okay. Um, I'm going to read uh, one that is after a painting by Julie Heffernan um, in the, the spirit of Ekphrasis. So the, the painting that this poem is after is called Tender Trapper. So if you have a chance, um, I would say look this up later. And the poem is called Lofty. He is perched shirtless in the convoluted tree. Flushed and unassailable, long legs dangled and tangling his rolling curls gleam. Engirdled by twining vine, rope threaded through fruit, then back around him. Seems secure? He will never go hungry, this growing boy trailing garlands of apples strung thickly on a line. At least he has his books, I think, though they too are out on a limb. Peculiar as the nearby turtle suspended by a vine midair. A nearby branch balances an adjacent sailing ship, which tips, pours its sea onto a cobbled ball strung up between trees. Ornamental, decorated with fruit and flora, the heads of incurious birds, the world of day jobs and offices beneath him. Once I believed he might make a career in architecture or automotive sciences. Red-bodied tree frogs observe in silence. I understand, but do not say. Fruit rots, wood decays, rope frays, bodies burn. Given time, this and other lessons will he learn. So I think that's it for me. So thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Thank you, Katie. That I love that nice sonified ending there. Uh, thank you so much for reading. I love these poems. And they're, they ring so true, somebody who has raised a child. Thanks very much. Our final feature today, and you can mute yourself. Yep, you have. And you can unmute yourself, Lauren, and you should say something soon. So you'll appear on the screen. <laughs> our final reader is Lauren Camp, our final feature, I should say. Lauren is the author of seven books, most recently, An Eye in Each Square. Great title. I love that. And Worn Smooth Between Devourings. Honors include the Dorset Prize and finalist citations for the Arab American Book Award, Housatonic Book Award, and Adrian Rich Award for Poetry. 
Her poems have been translated into Mandarin, Turkish, Spanish, French, and Arabic, and have recently appeared in the Missouri Review, Poem a Day, and Mid-America Review. She currently serves as Poet Laureate of New Mexico, hence the orange walls. <laughs> Thank you. Very glad to be here. Thank you, Robbie, for the invitation. Thank you, Diane and Katie, for your words and um, for letting me join you both in this reading. I'm going to read a few poems from each of the two newest books. And then despite whatever everyone is saying, I'm also going to read you a new poem. This is called the net signal reaches the body in a factor of two. I count 32 robins in the dead tree at the curve of our road. He counts days since rain. Every moment we assess the end of things, the knives we need to tender the meat for dinner. Before I leave, I put my face to the mirror Realize the long bones of heaviness and the bitter things I've forgotten. On the drive to work at a small corner off the interstate in an echo of sky, thirsty, wheeling along on small excursions, there are racks of army fatigues. Many people shop, sunglasses. I keep following directions to the shadow of cottonwoods. All the hope in this gold will erase. I don't lose sleep because it is winter and already full of its letdown. The weather keeps coasting through, rain plucking the ground, or the little shapes of dry air edged with olive trees. I hold nights in the little spot at my hip. I hold days by the wrists. Rest hours for loving what doesn't exist. Next time I drive to town, I see the top of the mountain is missing, dusted with gray, like a grief. Pinholes of light in a flat morning sky. Is it still a mountain if it is locked behind itself? I see my world in verbs and say it, mistaken, hurried with ongoing action, say it as origin and corners. My love returns from a cardiology appointment where he's taken his compass of anger and each consequence we can't determine. They've heard his heart beat a pace that is four times the normal. And so now I put my ear to his chest like a button. I am sewn there listening, holding on. There is a mountain pass in south, southwestern Colorado called Slumgullion Pass. And I've hiked it, but also with a name like that, you kind of have to write a poem. It has to go somewhere. So this is uh, called Backward to Slumgullion Pass. We were about to reach the sky. To our left, a full plummet and trees charred to graves, a pulse of ravens sketching land for dinner. In the bones of this, we saw tracts halved long after they were loosed from family, a ranch intersected by bridge, bridge separating consonants of old and new, grazing cows. We didn't need much or at all. My man might have considered happiness and how we have had it at times. He had that silk look of vulnerability. We were letting our silence grow and vanish and wake again. How human our hours begin again with only this to do. We hiked, our bodies called their limitations, foot, hip, more. We followed the veins of soil landing in truth. Lizards reeled on stone and slipped through edges. Birds pecked a melody that confessed nothing but peaks. Now was also then undeniable. We kept climbing, stone, 
stone and arm and maps, a circumference of tracks, of unbreakable heat. I stopped thinking about thought, simply the same red of the cliff that had always been, simply the violent height of exhaustion, some kind of sweet, each length of dust, the root of details. So I'm going to turn to An Eye in Each Square. Um, this book, these two books came out last year in the second half of last year, I should say. I don't recommend that to anybody here who wants to publish, but there you go. Um, the An Eye in Each Square is in conversation with the abstract artist Agnes Martin, whose paintings, if you don't know, are rather spare and spacious. Um, and I needed that. And I'm not really talking to her. I am sort of in conversation with her line. Uh, that was her, her primary element was a horizontal line and a very quiet one. And so um, in general today, uh, the poems I'm reading are all poems I haven't read to audiences before. I kind of like to do that when I've read from a book for a long time is to figure out which poems I'm not reading. And so um, this is a pantoum. It's called Self-Portrait with Agnes Martin. Peripheral desire to just sit here, not only in grief, but half light, late light, prisms of strangers, wanting not more than the inexact, the silence. The world's mouth contradicts such distance, tracked as it is with cost and shouting. All light is a prism and an easy absence, and I want not to hold more, a rest to reason. It is very quiet, without the grief and shouting. What could be better than distance? All I have to see is enough above and below. The view is without more reason. And that's how I learned to bend into quiet. Let the mind go on, watch it carry on honestly. Meanwhile, the eye sees enough knows its options, what is below the vibration of cruel news and common ceaseless actions. I wanna stop following these particulars, carry on in the open, not call to mind what cannot continue, the yelled vibrations and cruel ceaseless news that invents less of forever. The earth lives under these various spaces in the open, inside itself, inside even what cannot continue. What is more exact? I stare at painted silence. The world mouth contradicts forever. The earth loves plain space, various lessons, wants its soft peripheral desire. I have to just sit here, not only in grief, Thank you all so much for being here and for listening. I have one last poem. It is, um, it's from a body of work that I wrote uh, kind of, kind of avidly, kind of frantically while I was spending a month at the Grand Canyon a couple of years ago. Um, I, it was such an extraordinary experience. I was tasked with looking looking up, looking at darkness. I was there as uh, the my title was astronomer in residence. And that gave me the opportunity to look day and night, dawn and dusk, and much later than that. So I thought I would end with a poem from that grouping. This is called Terminus of Presence. To learn how I knew color, you would need to be full of a certainty, and like certainty, a swagger, as I was. Years I helmed any utterance of hue into me, sewing corners together to make a shape, and each shape into a shock and crackle. 
Galileo in his early notebooks reflected on the question, is there only one heaven? I used to think I knew. I have forgotten, forgetting even that I thought I had the power to insert any horizon. It had been a long time since those handfuls of tinting, and then of a sudden, I did not wish any longer to pull through its bronze and its blushes. I was home in the invisibility, the empty studio where I dated each hour by white light overflowing my face, an inversion of blankness. Color was behind me, I didn't own it. Galileo maintains that we exist in 10 movable heavens. Right when I read this, I had gone away and was at a point of wild musculature, a point that had raised up to let the sun set with a libidinous cache of overdrawn maroons. A crowd had gathered to watch the sky harvest from its own belly such pigment. And then it went down, the sun, back to its elsewhere. Another quick lifetime. The people taking photographs stopped because after all, they could see only the prologue of nothing. And this I will remember, how anything will invent its own color. I stood at the dark, which managed to be broad and narrow, froth and steel, so many visions before it would again become light. Thank you. Thank you for those lovely poems, Lauren. Thanks so much for being here. And in a moment, we'll turn to our open mic. It's a very small open mic since this reading was originally intended for the community at First Virtual. And any of you who don't know should take a look at the journal and think about sending something to it and become part of our community. And maybe Jim, you could put the web uh, address into the chat for the folks. Our first reader at the open mic will be Amy Small McKinney. Thank you. And I'm assuming one poem, Robbie. It's either one or two, five minutes max. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, in that case, I'm gonna, there's two. I'm gonna begin with a poem um, called Being, and in parentheses, it says Cemetery and Hotel. And it's from my forthcoming book, which is essentially about the body. Being. When you were raped, you didn't call it rape. I couldn't listen to the stones inside you cry corrosion. You wanted to believe it was love's hum. You didn't know the dead beneath their inscribed headstones were seeping into you like sap streaks disease. And you a maple that didn't know it was dying. You didn't listen to yourself tell yourself what was and wasn't or believe your own body its gravel of shock, its heart mouths widening, suffocating out of water. You were young. You couldn't say it aloud until you lay like a beach dolphin on a hotel bed where a non-doctor hovered over you, until the siege-shaped being inside rolled out of you, almost forgiveness. And, um... Well, I think some of this is also um, a prose poem from it's actually sort of still work in progress and it's from the um the same book and uh, it mentions heart I had a heart problem uh, following my husband's death and being a caregiver for years which is now fine dear body I have spent my life fixated on your flaws wishing you were someone else delicate and disarming as spider silk. Others viewed us as porcupine. It was not fury, but fear that forced me to quill you, nearly passed down those sorrow 
pointed swords, self-doubt always hungry for a new home. Now you hand me a damaged heart. A heart does not need to hide forbidden candy, does not need to consume the world in one sitting, does not compare the width of skinny legs to the span of a butt. Our heart, the size of two clenched fists, need only to beat. Oh, body, is it too late to say I love you? Remember, and how can we forget those rebellious breast cells, how at first I longed to ignore them? You wouldn't let me. I welcomed in toxic warriors to quash the disease. We were both grateful. Our hearts sang, yes, sang. This weakened but stubborn heart and our bodies almost 60,000 miles of blood vessels. How, if we follow that trail, we could cross the world twice? Unless, of course, we stop somewhere, having never seen a beach like this or trees like that. And then we would come home, wouldn't we? Thank you, Robbie and everyone. Thank you so much, Amy. Those were beautiful. Ron Bremer, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the open mic. So it's again, Everybody, two poems uh, or five, five minutes, whichever comes first. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me compliment the three remarkable readers uh, that, that featured tonight. Uh, thank you very much. They were, they were excellent. Uh, this poem was recently published in Open, a letter, excuse me, a, a journal of arts and letters. And here we go. Impacts persist. They test the limits of opening doors. Unknown doors open, teaching us. Possible windows reframe the dimensions of comprehension as if defined by growing ideas. Unbelievable ideas burn bushes that speak, striking the awe that approaches. Form and context Overwhelm. Your sometimes words glide in night and glimmer in the day. Your spectral voices reappear as bodies prospecting for tomorrow. I gain a glance into the incalculable mathematics of incongruities. You say you will help me to construct glaciers that move currents and structures that coalesce events, spreading shards of continents, connecting mountains to the sea. And suddenly I conquer new fears and explore vistas. Gone is the unseen. Untapped scenarios reemerge and remain, remind that despite all the lost, we have new worlds to discover. Thank you and have a pleasant evening. Thanks, Ron. Our next reader is Vicki. No, I'm sorry, it's Hetty. So you can unmute Hetty. You still here, Hetty? There you are, unmute, you're still muted. We can't hear you. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you uh, to the three uh, feature readers, uh, Dai, uh, Kathy, and um, Lauren. It's a delight uh, to uh, be here with you and see you. And of course, uh, thank you to um, the open mic reader, Amy, and I don't remember the name of the... Brian. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, I will be reading a couple of uh, ekphrastic poems from my uh, recently published uh, ekphrastic collection, or did you ever see the other side? And uh, can I uh, screen share? I have to make you co-host uh, because I don't want to give that to everyone. So maybe, Jim, if you could... I'm having trouble finding her on the list. 
because it isn't alphabetical, because that would make too much sense, right? <laughs> I can't find it. Drat. Okay, so I'm temp. Oh, there you are. Okay. Yay. There you are. Okay. I'm looking for the screen share. For some reason, I'm not seeing. Okay. You know, with the Sorry. new version is a little strange. Yeah, I found it. Okay, so the first uh, poem is inspired by this sculpture by uh, Paige Bradley, and it's titled Expansion. And um, here is the poem. Or what if scars would suddenly become translucent? And there's an epigraph by Hafiz. I wish that I could show you when you're lonely or in darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. Did the Persian poet mean that it would take a special viewer to perceive the truth within? We were taught to hide our sorrow forget and store grief in drawers. We learn to cover our imperfections with makeup and disappointments under a smile. We showcased our very best with trompe l'oeil pleated skirts. Wouldn't the art of concealing allow pain to grow insidiously, preventing the mind from exploring one's rocky shores and inner landscapes? Paige Bradley remembered the broken shards of a nude woman's sculpture seated in a lotus position. At night, a light radiates from its core through seam lines. Each crack a lightning, a victory, the way Japanese kintsukuroi mends fragments of a broken vessel with gold. The repairing of shattered tessera, expressing hurt as renewal. And what if invisible scars reclaimed their corporeality by being tattooed all over the body or materialized through translucent interstices, letting light out, revealing the archaeology of pain? Wow. And the next uh, is a very short poem. It's um, titled The Keyhole. And it was inspired by this painting by Wadada Lee, Leo Smith, who had a show here in Kalamazoo called Amfrachamastion, Amfrach The Language Scores. So he uh, had a many paintings of scores, but he's essentially a musician in Chicago, a jazz musician. So here's the poem. The keyhole. This is not the outline of a silhouette. I am drawing a keyhole to find my way out of my own cell. This is the black silk thread spun by the ink brush rising out of sweat and blood. Thank you. Thank you, honey. Took a while to find it. Now it's Vicky's turn at the open. Thank you. What wonderful readings. Such a joy to be here today. Thank you, Robbie, and thanks to all the readers. I'm just doing one poem. Um, everyone is slightly out of time. There are powerful women that within a flash of time are no longer able to live independently. Mortality is looked at a little harder these days without being swallowed alive in despair. Meditate on each necessary chore, moving the body in gratitude, realizing today's gift. <clears throat> the mind is too clear, too much thinking, and that's okay another gift given today. The memories that reside inside will be kept locked for safekeeping. Pain dives into the pen and the journey begins releasing all of the trapped tears. 
Sometimes the feelings flow as if being written by an unrecognizable force. There is a fire burning inside, unable to stop to take a breath. Just breathe. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next reader is Jennifer. And welcome, Jennifer. I don't remember you being here before uh, in this reading. Are you still here? Or did you give up? Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm here. I'm just trying to there we go. Oh my goodness. What a what a feast this is of poetry. Magnificent. Wow. Anyway, um, I'm glad to be here, proud to be here. I started writing late, really, in 2013. Um, and uh, it was when, when my wife was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. It took me a couple of years to start writing. Uh, these poems were published in One Art. I'm grateful for every poem published. Um, and I'm, I'm grateful to be in such austere company. Wow. Three Thinking Pink. I hated pink. It surrounded me in my mother's Chicago kitchen, bubblegum pink tiles, cafe curtains, countertops, the dial-up wall phone, pink, the color I ran away from, my mother's version of who I was supposed to be in my kitchen. I fold a muted pink bath towel, remember how it complimented Angela's wet brown shoulders, her clear brown eyes, reminds me why I keep one frayed pink cotton turtleneck in my closet, two pink plastic flowered bottles in my ba on my bathroom shelf. <laughs> one more will be like that, called Dance Lesson. Angela and I would dance in the living room, on a sidewalk, at the beach. I had four decades to memorize her dancing, how it stirred the air. That last time, her flowered dress, legs at rest in the wheelchair. I sway her arms high and wide, her eyes like pools of rain and moonlight. Now, wherever I am, and a soulful beat takes hold, I dance. She'd want me to let sorrow go. Those are lovely. Thank you, Jennifer. Rose, Rosemary, coming all the way to us from Peru. Yeah, I am. And I'm ready. That's even better. I'm reading from my latest uh, book that's come out last year, Life Stuff. And this is about my mother. I didn't. My brother said, don't come. I didn't fly out to see her one last time. My brother said, she doesn't know who I am. I figured she wouldn't know who I am either. I had never been near the death of my loved ones. I think I avoided the grief. I had lost them already. Or so I thought. Or so I hoped. I had just picked up my children from school. My brother called. She's gone. I could hear his utter disbelief. His voice choking in watery flame. And suddenly I felt empty, abandoned, a forlorn child in a big world, a woman without substance, homeless. And suddenly my losses multiplied and all the tears I'd never shed filled the salty ocean of grief and guilt. And suddenly I was there with her, wrestling with her demons. I wondered whether I would have recognized her. My father had been a dark blue life-size remake in a life-size box, vaguely reminding me of the man who held open his arms when I came flying. 
three days to dying, three days of longing, three days of holding on, perhaps, but I didn't. I didn't fly out to see her one last time. Leave everything and hurry to see her and let her touch me one last time. Let her know I cared enough to tell her one more time. I love you, Mom. Tell her one more time I'm strong because you made me so. Thank her one more time for giving me her life. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful verse. Our next reader is Dick Westheimer. Well, I won't repeat all the accolades uh, for all the readings, but I will definitely uh, I echo them in my heart. Um, I'll read uh, two poems, one, as is my want, my two most recent ones. This is a sonnet, little sonnet called Eve in the Garden. Her back is bare and run with sweat down to the curve of her hip. She's on her knees, pulls dock and chickweed from the berry bed points to a new shoot and tells me this is where the new fruit will be born come autumn. She pinches off the primocanes and pricks her calloused finger on a thorn, wipes it clean, and turns to tell me once again of escaping Eden, where all the produce falls from shelves. The grocery, you mean? Yes, she said, licking the blood from her bruised hand. The two of us stand there in the heat. She calls me Adam, and I call her Eve. For all these years, we believed we could avoid the fall. And this next one uh, is called Inside the Serotonin Industrial Complex, and it has two epigraphs. One from the movie War Games, the only winning move is not to play. And the other is from Calvin Thomas, who is a 17-year uh, uh, resident of the penitentiary at Angola, working the fields. You can call it anything else, he says. It's just slavery. When I shop these days, especially online, it feels so much like playing inside a video game. There, my avatar only dies when it runs out of coin, and to level up, all I need is ISP speed and free delivery for stuff I didn't know about until it came up in my feed. This is first-person shooter shit point and click on the new Bluetooth earbuds, and a child miner in the DRC falls in a pit. Need some chicken wings? An inmate at Angola State Pen gets crushed in the gears of a feather-plucking machine. A sack of flour in my cart or frosted flakes? Outside an Arkansas lockup, a pennies per day guy in an orange jumpsuit has his skull cracked by a truncheon. Everyone is in this game. Some hands are on PCs, some on business plans, some on guns, some bloody and raw pulling rocks from the ground. This is the age where my shopping cart is filled by clicks of iron leg shackles and handcuff, handcuff hasps of cell door locks and a rifle's trigger lifting. This is the age of tantalum and tin, of Archer Daniels Midland enslaving someone's kin, of Tony the Tiger and Androids and the Mac laptop I'm typing on, which leaks the tears of some boy or girl who will never, or man who will never be paroled. It's the double chocolate chip cookies I've made from flower ground from the nightmares of an old guy working the fields of parchment. It's the cotton sheets I sleep on, woven out of inmates' dreams. It's hope weeded from the red clay fields near Angola's gates. Point and click. Same minute shipment of serotonin squeezed from every human animal changed inside my video game. Point Click, drop in another coin, keep playing the game until I've won. Keep playing the game until I've won. Point, click, keep playing the game. Woohoo! Thank you. 
Thank you. Our last person at the open mic is Alan Wallowitz. Thanks, Robbie. Um, one poem, and uh, this is for my friend, uh, Freddie Child, who would have been his 75th birthday today. Since we knew each other since we were 18, we got to spend a lot of them uh, together. And uh, this is the first one I'm getting to spend in a long time without him. It's called uh, The Binding. You can look all you want to the science of sharp edges, but if you walk around the earth against the setting sun and never stop, time might relent in its awful course and give you time to think. You've tried to do what's right, pay your debts, be a man. Still, no matter where you turn, you meet of your father, and that darkness he carried in silence becomes more and more your own. Might as well walk backwards and watch him in the mirror, the razor stropped to a rhythm that might have been the pounding of your heart, and the soap slowly brought to a lather with those circular movements you memorized from the time time began, and what looked so impossibly cold could possibly warm a face. As he scraped his own in four smooth strokes, you watched breathless, trusting, scared. Then he took your small face in one broad butcher's hand, held it to the dull back of the blade and wiped you clean. Thanks. Thank you, Alan. Well, we've come to the end of the reading, so I am going to stop recording and we can hang out and talk a little if you'd like. Um, so I'm going to do that right now.